Good morning. <laughs> At least here. Yeah, it's a little <laughs> early for us. 10 a.m. <laughs> for you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, we're horrible. Okay, so today we have a really interesting topic that we've never, ever done before. We have um, Bertie Gregory, who is a Nat Geo filmmaker. And I'm kind of excited because this kind of reminds me of the old days, like remember when we used to watch Mutual of Omaha? <laughs> right, I mean, this is kind of photography that I've never really done before. The closest was when we were in the Dalmore and we were trying to shoot a stag. Oh, right. But I mean, that was pretty cush compared to what he does. Yeah, exactly, I completely <laughs> forgot about that. Yeah. Okay, let's introduce Rachel. She's our social media director. How you doing, Rachel? Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We are not actually Zacuto live today. We are Zacuto not quite so live. So because of some scheduling conflicts, we're recording this show. So I'm speaking to you from about a week ago. But we are still here. We're watching with you in the chat on Facebook premiere. So comment and say hi like usual. We will pass along your questions to Bertie via email to answer as his schedule permits. But he's a very, very busy guy. We're super lucky to have him here. So without much further ado, let's go for it. OK, wow, Zacuto as live right yeah, live to tape. pretending to be live, live to tape yeah live i don't know what tape. the word is anymore we don't have a word for this <laughs> hey birdie how you doing good morning good good thanks how are you guys doing good okay i know we have a clip that kind of introduces you and what you do so let's roll that clip and then we'll have a chat at first glance the arctic feels brutally devoid of life though a select group of animals have figured out a way to thrive. But the real force here works quietly underfoot. Every winter, sea ice starts small and delicate. Then it grows over millions of square miles. How is it possible that this freezer holds the key to our entire planet? Like a lung, sea ice breeds life into the Arctic every year in a cycle that impacts the climate across the globe. This is the story from the edge of the Canadian Arctic, where it all starts. My name's Bertie Gregory, and I'm a National Geographic wildlife filmmaker. Everything is at stake. We're all waiting for the big freeze. Wow. That's beautiful stuff. Yeah, wow. Okay, so my first question is, is like when you were shooting those polar bears, were you, how far away from you, and what length of a lens were you using to get that? Yeah, so generally you try not to be too close to polar bears um, because they are they are one of the few animals that that are potentially quite dangerous. Um, and so, I mean, for those close-ups, often you know, you, even though we were using a Canon CN20, the fifty to a thousand, um, you still have to be pretty close to get to get big close-ups. So um, we were, I don't know, probably the closest we were ever on on foot with them was maybe. 20 25 meters um and that was always because the bears want to come to us we'd never think of approaching a bear um you can see in the right hand side of that picture that's steve schellenberg he was the polar bear expert we were working with he he essentially talks to bears and and that sounds ridiculous but he does he'd judge their body language as to how curious how confident they were and, and let them come as you know a certain distance and then encourage them to to go around us or, or go away um but one of the things that we that we really benefited from was was yeah using the Canon 50 to 1000. So, you know, with that teleconverter in, you're at 1500 millimeters, and then we're shooting on the the red helium 8K, and often we drop the resolution down to four or five K, drop the compression ratio down, so we still had good quality. That means you're shooting at the equivalent of something like a 2300 millimeter lens. So Amazing. that wow. allows you to get those those big close-ups. I saw a close-up of just the teeth. Uh, it's, how close was that animal to you? I mean, that is it, that 25 meters? Yeah, probably 25, 30 meters. Yeah. He, yeah, this this particular bear came over and and laid down in front of us and then started doing all kinds of crazy yoga poses and stretching and 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 chilling out. Um, and what's actually really interesting about this this particular picture, um, it's a frame grab from the footage, is that you see how he's got these massive canines on his lower jaw, and then just behind his canines, there's a there's a gap in his jaw where he doesn't have any teeth. Mm -hmm. Well, other, other species of bear don't have that. He does actually have teeth there. They're just vestigial, they're within its gum. And what that allows the polar bear to do is it basically gets those teeth out of the way so those canines can sink even deeper into their seal prey. And that means he's got a really, really good grab of it. So when he's pulling a seal that can be 600 pounds out of the water, 
um, yeah, he's got a really, really good grip. So that's something that only polar bears have evolved. It's called vestigial premolars. Um, and, and that was something that I read about, but until I was actually looking down the viewfinder and went, oh yeah, it turns out that is, that is true. <laughs> um, and you'd, yeah, you'd only ever see wow. that when this bear's rolled on its back um, with its, with its, yeah, having a yawn. So let me ask you a question. You're a 25 year old guy. I mean, did you watch like planet earth and go, oh my God, this is what I want to do? Essentially. Yeah. Um, pretty <laughs> much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up watching nature documentaries on the BBC. So that's where I'm from in England. And uh, yeah, it's something that I've always, always wanted to do. And through a long series of ridiculous events, I won't bore you with. Um, yeah. One thing led to another and, and I started photo assisting one of the National Geographic magazine photographers, a guy called Steve Winter. And he was really my gateway into Nash Geographic. Um, and uh, yeah, now I, I get to, to make my own series, which is yeah, very exciting. So I'm sure a lot of our viewers are wondering the same thing I am is, um, you know, most of us and our viewers are filmmakers and we plan our shoots, but your situation is different. You can't really plan for a lot of this. So I guess I'd like to hear how you approach a project like this, what you can plan for, and then how long it might take to get what you're looking for, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a huge research process um, uh, and we're, we want to find stuff that hasn't been filmed before. Um, in the case of this series, one of the key pieces of behavior we were going for was interactions between wolves and polar bears. Um, I'd heard that there was this pack of wolves that was kind of brave enough to, to take on polar bears, even chase and, and hunt them. Um, and there were no pictures of this. It was solely anecdotal stories. And that's kind of a scary thing because you need to be able to go to National Geographic and to get them to convince them to do something, you need to be able to make a big, big promise to them. But obviously if that promise turns out to be wrong, um, you're done. So it's a careful process of calculation as to, okay, I've heard this, is this true? Can this be true? And even if it is true, is it filmable? Is it something that happens once every 20 years? Uh, or is it something that's happening once a month? Um, and then once you know that frequency, then I was confident that we could get a two shot of a wolf and a polar bear in the same frame based on what I'd kind of read and seen and talked to the, the people there. Um, but yeah, then when we got there, it turned out that it was, it was very, very difficult. Um, this wolf pack would only every time that you've seen footage of it they found us rather than the other way around to some extent um they really control when they get filmed but yeah they were they were incredibly brave anytime they bumped into a polar bear they'd they'd have a they'd have a go at it for for the first three episodes in the series um we had one six week shoot and for the second two episodes we had a three week shoot three to four weeks so that kind of gives you an idea of mm. how much time we had okay let's roll that clip There's another one. There's three. There's a third one coming. A big pack of wolves could take down a polar bear, but with only three against one, who is predator and who is prey? The bear runs the numbers and goes for it. Wow, is wait, is this your voice in there? Yeah, that was yeah. part of the question I was going to ask him. Is uh, is um, so? Are you proposing this to Nat Geo? They don't come to you with a project, or does it work both ways? Is I guess is what I'm wondering about. And then also, how do yeah. you sort of end up being talent? You know what I mean? Right. So um, it can work both ways. Um, how so? This season, this series, Wildlife, is now in its third season. Um, and uh, I kind of came to National Geographic with, with the first season, which was all about trying to find coastal wolves on Vancouver Island. Um, and they, I, I pitched it as a television program and they said, uh, no, um, what, if, what if we do a web series? And that's kind of how this was born. Um, and now each season, yeah, I've, I've pitched to them and said, right, this season I want to go to X. Uh, and they say no or yes. And then and then we, we go mm -hmm. from there. In answer to your question of how uh, I did on-screen stuff, when I worked with Steve Winter, um, the, the National Geographic magazine photographer I mentioned, um, I started as his camera assistant. Um, and then we realized together that we were having these amazing animal encounters that were ending up just as stills. And there was so much opportunity to shoot video of them, especially as that's what I was really passionate about. 
So um, I started shooting more video while he was shooting stills. Um, and National Geographic turned that into, uh, well, we ended up making two one-hour programs together, one about the urban leopards of Mumbai, um, and the second one about uh, jaguars that, that hunt uh, caiman. It's like a big crocodilian uh, in Brazil. Um, and during those two programs, uh, I think National Geographic realized that, that I could talk on camera. Um, so I kind of started as more of a, like a cameo role in, in the first program. And then in the second program, we more kind of co-presented it. Um, and then uh, for, for these series, yeah, I, I host them. And, and that's just kind of uh, my style. I'm a, yeah, a camera person first. Uh, that that kind of tries to take the viewer along along. So you're shooting that sound. I, well, I don't want to say that, correct. but you're <laughs> shooting that sound, and then you're voing afterwards. Correct. So there's a guy over my shoulder the whole time, a guy called Spencer Millsap, um, and he's yeah shooting the adventure of it, um, uh, and uh, and yeah he's he's always over my shoulder pretty much the whole time, and so I'll be shooting the natural history, uh, you know like. You know, these wolves in front of me here and then um i'll turn over and, and talk to him about biologically what's going on but then also just you know the genuine ups and downs and reactions and, and all that mm. kind of thing trying to bring bring the natural history to life wow you truly are merlin perkins that was you don't know this guy do you he used to have the show called mutual of omaha have you ever heard of oh him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so you know that wow i mean the guy like was he, they would film, I don't think he was the filmmaker, but they would film him and he was in all these crazy places. I mean, that was kind of the first time we ever saw shows like what you're doing. So your thing almost has this feeling of a vlog to me. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, really where it all kind of stemmed from the inspiration is when, when you watch those BBC Planet Earth series, the last 10 minutes is when they show you how they did it. And even though 95, 99% of the work and effort goes into the main part of the program, the last 10 minutes is often the bit that everyone talks about the next day. And I thought, well, hang on a second. We can combine these two things. We can combine the beautiful, beautiful, epic natural history um, with uh, the, the making of the, the ups and downs of how, how to do it. Because I think there's, there's something about seeing a polar bear, um, you know, because most people will never see a polar bear. I think to a certain extent, it's a bit disconnecting. But the moment you see someone in front of a polar bear, you know, reacting to it, I think it it, in my opinion, helps bring it to life. Yeah, I think it uh, does, actually. It really adds a, a nice component. So, I mean, Jens and I have bumped into BBC shooters over our years, and you know that they were, like, steeped in airy SRs. Have you thought about, you know, shoot in the old days when people would shoot these types of things on film versus shooting them on video? Yeah, I mean, you'd struggle. I mean, one of the things that makes this work is that Spencer, who's filming me, is literally rolling... Well, he's he's trying to capture moments, right? We we don't want to uh, recreate stuff afterwards. We want to get it for real in the moment. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he's just rolling the entire time. So I, I think you'd really you'd really struggle with that. We certainly benefit from being able to just shoot and shoot and shoot. Right. So I think uh, our audience would probably love to uh, hear from you, like what your complement of cameras and and crew was there, because. Uh, you know, mainly we see you. A couple of times we see the the you know your guide and, and a few others. But so, what do you what do you actually have in the field? Sure. So I'm shooting uh, the primary kind of long lens natural history setup uh, is a, a Red Weapon Helium AK with a 50 to 1000. I didn't change lens the entire shoot. That's the power of that lens that you can shoot your wides with you know an animal type well relative wides with an animal tiny in the frame and then you can crush into 1500 mil and get those eyeball shots mm. um it's a total game changer of a lens uh it's on a um o'connor 2560 head uh and then w on whatever legs we need a lot of the time i'm shooting on uh really tiny baby legs because uh, we want to get super low to the ground so we're at eye level in the case of this cute little heart seal pup um, or with the bigger animals, the wolves, the bears, almost being underneath their eye level, really looking up at them so they feel really big and epic. Um, and it also chucks that background way out of focus, um, having the background further away from them. Um, so Spencer, who's filming me, uh, Spencer Millsap, uh, he's shooting on a Sony FS7. So that's kind of his, his mm. go-to camera. Um, yeah, it's, it's you know light relatively small uh, sheets 4k which is what we need for the deliverable and then one big element of, of what I do um, certainly when I'm just doing straight natural history stuff not this presenter-led stuff is a uh, drone stuff um, so uh, yeah inspire 2 with the x7 camera um, and a drone that I'm 
uh, pretty obsessed with at the moment is the Mavic 2 Pro. Um, for how small and tiny and how long the battery life is, it is an absolute game changer, the places you can get it into. Um, the entire wolf hunt scene, which is at the end of the episode, that's what this frame grab is from, was all shot on the, the Mavic 2. Um, all right, we're going to take a look at that clip right now. Okay. There used to be two million wolves in North America, but 400 years of systematic extermination has left us with just 80,000. While places depend on these wolves as they regulate prey populations, we must give them the chance to bounce back. I mean, uh, years ago, you'd need helicopters and stuff, and that would yeah. scare everything away and right. be expensive. The key thing about that Mavic 2 is, is in the HQ mode, it punches in, and I can't remember what the equivalent focal length is. It's something like 35 mil or 40 mil. Um, and that difference to me is critical because usually on cheap, relatively cheap drones, you have a super wide lens, mm -hmm. um, and, and just having that extra bit of focal length makes it feel cineflexy. It makes it feel, you know, helicoptery, you know, cinematic. Um, so that's why I think it's really a game changer. But yeah, as you said, you're not shooting at 35 mil from a helicopter. When I was reading about Planet Earth, some of those shots were amazing. They were like kind of dollying down these vines. I don't know if they were using uh, dollies or those were uh, drones, but I think that they like did this again and again and again so that after a while the animals just became acclimated to these noises. Is that true? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I found that that certain species, you know, pe people say that drones scare wildlife. And whilst that is true, sort of, it's, it's the pilot that's scaring the wildlife, not the drone. Um, and if flown in the right way with the right individual animal, um, it's amazing, you know, what you can do with drones and animals. Um, but yeah, it's totally down to the, the individual. And certainly certain individual animals will habituate to drones. What is important to us is that we want to film natural behavior. So we do a lot of research into making sure that the animals are not going to be influenced by us buzzing over the top of them. Because whilst it's not a helicopter, it still makes noise. It's still potentially annoying. Are you using uh, sliders or dollies? Yeah. Uh, on the last season of this series, we filmed on a little island called South Georgia in the South Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we did a lot of stuff with penguins. And these penguins have evolved on islands with no land predators. And so... You can be, you know, me to the laptop screen, a couple of feet away from these animals and, and they just do their thing. And that's really when we use stuff like sliders, because, yeah, you can slide alongside them as they kind of waddle up the rocks. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, we also use um, you know, bovies and ronins and stuff. So we're a bit more free. We can really follow them wherever they go. All right. Wow. Your, your footage is spectacular. Let's take a look at another clip. Hang on, Steve. You seen that bear over there? He's cooking him pretty good. Hey, buddy. You need to start thinking twice about walking in. There are very few animals that will actually try and hunt people, and polar bears are one of those animals. Hey, slow down. Slow down. Hey, we're not an easy meal. Hey, hey. Slow down, hey. Slow down. Slow down. I'm gonna hit you with a rod. Hey, close enough. No, no, no. No. <sighs> Sit down. Sit. There you go. Well, Steve told it to sit and it sat. <laughs> Unbelievable. Hey, go play with your friend. That's great. I love the tension building. Like, yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. There's nothing. I, I got to admit this. This. I don't know how you guys came up with this concept of the BTS mixed with the footage, but it changes the whole, like you said, the whole tension, the whole nature. Mm -hmm. It's really a terrific. Because you feel uh, worried about 
the crew, you know, in a way that yeah, right, tag, exactly. You know You're I mean? exactly, you know, you become part of the shoot. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask another question. Uh, a lot of shooters might have to occasionally uh, work with animals or shoot animals, and they're not animal experts like you. Do you have like any, you know, tips uh, to maybe? you know, not only in shooting, but maybe how to get the animals to react or, you know, that sort of thing for the layman, if you want to call it that. One of the key things is to to know your subject, um, you know, just like, a, a, you know, a, a journalist who's reporting on politics is going to know all about politics. You know, you, you want to be totally clued up with the particular animal you're you're working with. Um, and and so that means that you're relaxed when you're filming them. In the case of the polar bear, when you're probably not very relaxed because they could be huge um, <laughs> and quite interested in you. We work with people that are much more skillful and knowledgeable than, than myself. Um, and that's really important because when the bear's coming over, Steve's doing all the, the safety stuff and, and making sure that the, we're safe and therefore the bear's safe. Um, because if the bear is lays a finger on us that's our fault but ultimately something bad's going to happen to that bear so that's why it's really important because otherwise it's a selfish thing to do to go walking with a polar bear if you don't know what you're doing um so yeah because steve's handling all of that it means that all i'm thinking about is keeping that bear's face in focus um or, or chatting to, to spencer the other camera so um i think that would be the key thing is is knowing really knowing your subject um or being with someone that knows the subject because you know just I often, birds in flight are a great example. All birds fly in different ways, different speeds, different wing flaps. It takes me a day to figure out how to keep up with them, how to pan with them, how to follow focus them. And then once you kind of learn how, uh, you know, how an eagle flaps, how it moves, that means that your shots just get better and better. So mm. yeah, it's spending the time with, with the animal. So you get to be able to predict what it's going to do and, and also increase the chances of it doing something interesting because in wild you know in nature animals don't do much most of the time you need to spend the time with them to increase your chances of getting lucky it's just amazing to me you know and i was watching that clip there's a little yellow square i mean what an iconic symbol that you're working for this oh, I see. Yeah. this company that for a hundred and some odd years just is a yellow square and we know exactly what it is mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, uh, it, it, it's very scary a lot of the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, very exciting. Um, you know, one of the things that, whilst but the reason it's scary is because a lot of the kind of, uh, you know, legends with, at National Geographic um, uh, that have you know, been shooting stories for 20, 25 years more, um, they all say uh, you're only as good as your last story. Um, so uh, yeah, that's why every single time even though this series is in its third season, it's it's just as scary as the first. Um, because, uh, yeah, you know that if, if this goes badly and you don't come back with the goods and you don't you know, deliver on your promises, there's uh, there's a thousand other people queuing up to, to, to do the same thing. So, um, yeah, it's for sure an, a, a really special privilege, um, a very scary one. Wow. Let's play another clip. Norman, we're good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. giant belly there's a big swim float to help the pup breathe you can see she's so protective of it in the water anytime any of the other adults come anywhere near her she chases them off so aggressively it's really doing it it's swimming look at it go Amazing wow. stuff. You know, I just realized that I forgot that I did all that underwater <laughs> photography and films mm. with my dad when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But in those days, you know, we were using Super 8 cameras and these giant, you know, cast housings and whatnot. What kind of a housing do you have for that? So that's a, that's a Nauticam housing, and it's the same same camera, still the Red, red Weapon Helium 8K. Um, but actually, it's funny you mentioned about about using big heavy housings that is actually a good thing underwater because whilst 
that's a total drag to lump around, particularly on slippy ice, out the water. Once you're in the water, you you better you're balancing your housing, so it's negatively buoyant, so it doesn't weigh anything. But because it's big and and relatively heavy, um, it has a lot of inertia, and that's really what you use, like you're using a Movi or a Ronin, so that it's it's smooth and it's gliding around, and, and it makes sure that the shots are stable. So uh, the sound. I know this is going to be kind of a stupid question, but the sound you're putting in afterwards. The red isn't recording any sound within the housing. Um, all of that stuff you can hear, though. Uh, I have a GoPro on the back of my housing, looking back at me, and that has a, a little Sennheiser waterproof microphone on it, and that's how we do all of the pieces, the camera audio. Wow. Um, that's uh, that's real real sync. Okay, and what about lighting underwater? All natural lighting. I mean, the nice thing about shooting under ice is whilst it has many challenges, like it's freezing cold and there's ice moving all over the place, um, it it does, is really bright. Uh, under the ice, it's, re it's pretty dark, but just outside on the edge of the ice where I am, in the open water, yeah, it, it, there's just light bouncing everywhere. So it makes really cool little sparkles and, and twinkles and all kinds of things. Okay, so how cold was it in that water? So salt water freezes, uh, at a colder temperature than fresh water, so it freezes at uh, minus 1.8 Celsius, which I think is 28.8 Fahrenheit. So um, because it's the ice is actually melting that time of year, it was in early March, um, the water's probably a touch warmer than that, but probably not above fresh water freezing. It's really, really, really cold. So you get in the water, and even though I had a dry suit on, you know, a wetsuit hood that's, you know, nine mil thick, um, I probably had 40 minutes in the water before my hands were done, and I get out. And then the next time I get in, I'd have less time, maybe 20 minutes. Some of these shots were looking up at the mum and uh, pup together. Um, so that was all done free diving. So I probably free dined out, to, I don't know, 20 feet or something, not very deep. Oh, okay. um, and uh, yeah, but most of the time, because the pup's on the surface, I'm just super close with a wide angle lens. I was using the Canon 11 to 24 mil pretty much the whole time at 11. So you're reducing the amount of water between the subject uh, and, and the camera whilst still keeping it in the frame because it's a wide angle lens. Uh, and, and that just means that the shots just look way, way clearer and crisper. You know, when you watch mm -hmm. series like Blue Planet, the visibility looks a lot better than it actually is because of those wide angle lenses. Hmm. I often wondered why, you know, nowadays, I mean, for shots like that, that you couldn't use like a hothead and a crane to go down there and then, you know, have remote controls to kind of move it around. Have, do you ever do stuff like that? Yeah, with certain uh, species that are more um, skittish, yeah. I mean, particularly often with macro stuff, when you need a lot more control, that's not really my bag. I do, uh, you yeah, know, not much stuff underwater. That's a small part of what I do. But some of the guys that do water all year round, um, uh, yeah, they have all kinds of uh, underslung tripods that they use underwater. Uh, yeah, all, all, all kinds of things. So, so the diving thing uh, brings me to another question. For people who might be, you know, the young guys watching this that might want to get into this type of work, what skills do you need? Uh, I mean, obviously diving helps you out here because that extends the, the kind of shooting you can do. But you need, you know, probably need to be a rock climber, and of course, filmmaking experience. What, what else well, would you recommend? Yeah. I'm quite generalist in that I do a bit of everything. It really helps to have uh, a niche that you're really good at. Um, mm. I think in that said, in, in you know, talking about the generalist, I think it's sort of expected now, certainly in the natural history industry, if you're a, starting as a camera assistant, that as well as doing all your camera assistant stuff, you're also capable of flying drones really well. You can do time lapse. You can you know you can do motion control time lapse. You can use a slider. You can use a crane. Um, your you know, follow focus on a long lens is good and you can pan around on a tripod. You know, having all these little skills um, is really useful because that might be your break. Your camera assisting someone on a shoot, they're shooting you know, traditional long lens on sticks on tripod and they say, oh, we need some drone of this behavior. Suddenly the drone shots are the shots in the sequence and it's like, who did that? Oh, that guy, cool. Next time, I don't want him as an AC. He's coming as the, the drone guy or, or, or whatever. Mm. So. Yes, having lots and lots of skills, but but making sure that you can really do them well. I know that you're on a you have to you're going off on a shoot, but I have one final question for you. What advice would you give to a young person um, who really wants to break in? Actually, any age that really <laughs> wants to break into this type of shooting. How, what do they do? What should they do? Well, I think the first thing is is and it sounds really obvious, but 
do it. You know, this industry has been so democratized in that everyone has a camera, you know, whether it's a, you know, a, a, anything down to the phone in their pocket. Uh, you know, everyone has access to, you know, generally everyone has access to like basic editing software. So go make films, make mistakes because making, I think make it, there's no, there's no school that can teach you certain skills that you will learn just by making stuff and making mistakes. Um, so that would be it. And then networking is a huge thing in this industry, uh, being uh, a nice person. You know, we go away on shoots and we live on top of each other for six weeks. The producer is going to want to hire a camera person that they like um, because they have to you know, get on with them. Um, so you can be the best camera person in the world. But if you're an asshole, no one's going to want to work with you. So being nice, so. being able to network. Um, I, I think that a key thing with National Geographic um, they run a load of really cool programs to get in with them. Um, one of them is, is the National Geographic Society, the nonprofit side, um, has the a Young Explorer grants, early career grants, where you pitch them a project and that can have a media component that is stills, photography, video, presenting, podcast, radio, whatever. The point is you pitch them a story you're really passionate about and, and if you're successful, they give you the funding to do it, which is cool. But most importantly, your work, finished work, then gets in front of National Geographic Television or National Geographic Magazine, whichever genre it makes sense for. That's many people in that are in this building. This is where I am now in Washington, D.C., National Geographic HQ. That's how many of the photographers, filmmakers, that's their first step in is is with those those National Geographic Society grants. So definitely check those out. Wow, Bertie, this was a, a great show. We really, your work is spectacular. I don't say that very often, mm -hmm. but it is, it's, you know, obviously it's incredible. And I really like the whole style, the BTS, BTS mixed with your work. It's, it's, it's great. Thanks for being on the show. Cool. Well, thanks very much for having me. And yeah, if anyone wants to watch it, it's all free available online at natgeo.com forward slash wildlife, super easy URL or on National Geographic YouTube. Um, uh, and yeah, and if you want to see some more of my stuff, uh, I'm at Bertie Gregory on Instagram. That's the best way of keeping up with, with my stuff. But yeah, thanks very much for, for having me. Okay, thanks. Rachel? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bertie. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We really please encourage you to go watch the show. It's absolutely stunning. And we follow Bertie on Instagram as well. And it's everything he does is gorgeous. There's a link in the video description to watch the big freeze. Like, again, you can go to natgeo.com forward slash wildlife. So thank you to ICANN who provide all the lighting for our show, to our sponsors, Canon, Road Mics, Kess the Crane. We will see you all in a couple of weeks with a new show. Bye. <laughs>